Hello, everybody. Um, we are back. We are now going into session two of this uh, very um, productive and very informative um, um, webinar. Um, I am Marielena Botazzi, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this uh, session two. I, alongside with Dr. Peter Hotis, who just uh, heard him in the prior session, I'm the Associate Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, and I'm also co-directing Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. And for us, it's a great pleasure to partner with Florida International University and with the team from the Global Health Consortia to uh, bring you um, such prominent and very um, insightful set of speakers that I'm very uh, pleased to introduce. And um, the session that we're gonna focus uh, in the next uh, couple of hours is specifically after hearing about all that's happening uh, with regards to COVID-19 uh, vaccines and vaccination, we're now gonna uh, put our eyes on uh, new variants, um, the impact of having them, the new waves, um, and how this will eventually impact um, vaccines and vaccinations, and the strategies really of how we're gonna be able to uh, not only preserve the public health benefits of vaccination, but prepare uh, in the event that we certainly need to modify or um, improve or generate new knowledge and certainly new vaccines. So I think the way that uh, we're gonna do this uh, um, um, session two is, I'll just give you a very brief introduction of our three um, speakers. Um, um, each of them will present um, their uh, lecture. Um, then when we're done with the three speakers, we, I'm gonna introduce you um, additional panelists that will join into the conversation. We're gonna have the panelists uh, reflect a little bit about what they heard from the lectures, and then we'll open it up um, like in the prior panel um, to some uh, Q&A and just discussion points. So we have a, a very esteemed list of uh, speakers. I'm gonna start by introducing to you all Professor um, Esther Sabino. She's a physician scientist and immunologist at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She's an associate professor in the Department of Infectious Diseases at the um, USP School of Medicine. Her major uh, research areas include transfusion safety, HIV, Chagas disease, arboviruses, um, sickle cell anemia, and she's a principal investigator in multiple awards, um, especially studying neglected tropical diseases uh, looking specifically at biomarker discovery um, and identifying, characterizing, or validating potential uh, biomarkers that can help us um, determine uh, how can we detect not only severity of these infections, but also, of course, how we can better understand these diseases. So welcome, Dr. Sabino, and we will, we will look forward to your uh, presentation. Um, before I uh, introduce you specifically for the first lecture, um, I would like to introduce Mr. Um, Chaim Rafalowski. He's originally from Chile, but he was trained in management and public administration from the University of Tel Aviv in Israel. Um, disaster management and EU projects coordinator currently at the Israeli Megan David Adam. Um, and uh, currently um, has served and um, helps in all the aspects related to national emergency. Um, he uh, assumed positions of national coordination in disaster management and international co cooperation since 2006. And currently, of course, um, he's part of the National Crisis Committee of the Israeli Ministry of Health, acting as a liaison um, between his organization and, of course, um, the coordinating table. So uh, welcome also, uh, Mr. Rafalowski. Uh, and our third speaker will be Dr. Marco Safadi. He's a specialist in pediatric infectious diseases, also from Brazil at the Sao, Sao Luis Hospital in Sao Paulo. He's an active member of various committees, uh, including member of the Experts Advisory Board in Latin American Society of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases, a member of the Permanent Advisory Board on Immunization Practices of the Ministry of Health of Brazil, and brings a wealth of expertise on immunizations, especially immunizations such as meningococcal, pneumococcal, 
congenital toxo, influenza, rotavirus, HPV, community acquired infections. So as you can see, we have quite a, 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 a list of uh, wonderful speakers. So I will um, introduce the first lecture. She will speak um, related to the resurgence of COVID-19 in Manaus, Brazil. Uh, and despite the high pre seroprevalence. And so she's going to talk about a little bit about natural herd immunity. The second lecture by Mr. Rafalovsky will spoke, we focus on the case study from Israel. Uh, we have been hearing some wonderful results uh, and he can tell us a little bit about implementation and impact. And then Dr. Safari um, will um, certainly um, speak uh, uh, about his experience. So um, I now will give the baton to um, Dr. Sabino. I can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So thank you for the invitation. I thought of describing quickly the study that uh, we did in Manaus and another seven cities. So I'll start just showing the, the, how the epidemic moved in Brazil. So this is number of deaths and this is number of severe cases confirmed and non-confirmed over time. And we see that the peak was May and, and it was a long peak and was declining and around the election time in Brazil starts to go up again. But this kind of, of, of figure is not similar to all cities. And here are the seven, eight cities that we choose to study. So the idea was to understand, to better understand the attack rate using blood donors as uh, a proxy of the po uh, general population. And as you can see, some cities had really big peaks and others had a lower rate of disease. Uh, so. It, it was quite different. We don't really understand why it's so different in different cities of Brazil. So we thought of using blood donors because it's really an easy population to obtain samples. And the second reason is that the blood donors in Brazil, it's mandatory for the blood banks to save samples for six months. So when, when kits and tests were available, those samples were still sitting there and could be used for prevalence studies. So the idea was to do 1,000 blood donors per, per month. Blood donors doesn't really represent the city, so we stratify the samples we wanted to test by zip code, and we did retrospectively uh, with the kits like Abbott arrived in Brazil, was the one large uh, that can run large number of samples, only were available in Brazil by the end of June. So this was the kit that was used, and we did retrospectively and in real time. So this is what I was saying. This is a very interesting population to use because the cost to do everything, getting technicians, all the people involved was around, uh, around $100,000 to do all this study during 10 months without including the cost of the kids. So once you do the uh, study like this, you need to understand the limitations. One is the population that that we then had to correct because we are using blood donors and donations only uh, are, uh, possible to, to do from 16 to 65 years old. And then we also need to correct for the test, um, all the imperfections of the test. This includes sensitivity, specificity, and also as we saw early on when we started screening, the waning, that specifically this kit waned more more rapidly than others in the market. So in relation to population, there are differences. So in general, the blood donor populations were younger as described by the census from 2010. Uh, you have more males in one hour. So there were a few differences that we could change and, and, and make some corrections to try to, to be more similar to the general population. And also in terms of uh, uh, areas of the city, 
it was quite uniform, not, not, not a lot of difference. So we believe we did reach a lot of people all around the city and as, as for, uh, representative, relatively well representative in, in, in this study. So the other thing is the problem of the sensitivity of the assay because the assays have a very the, the sensitivity decline when you use samples from individuals with less symptoms. Here are, are patients, here are convalescent plasma donors. So we see that there was a decrease in the sensitivity. And the other problem is that we, we quickly realized that the antibody decline over time among these, uh, these plasma donors. For, for everybody. So we needed to, to see a way to correct this. And this was not so simple because the decline, this half life decline for this kit was different according to disease severity, age, gender, and age. So it's not so easy to find a model to, to get all this, this aspect. So when we were uh, analyzing the data from Manaus, we saw that, that early on, uh, just in few months, the, the, the prevalence moved from 5.5% to 46%. And then it started declining and now, now almost in two months was half of that value. So we used this decline and we modeled the decline to correct, assuming that in these first two months there was no infection. And so we tried to correct this. And in the, in the way it moved, it went from 46% to 52 and correct through sensitivity of the assay to 65% in, in the month of uh, June, July. So this is how we did our correction. And in Sao Paulo, then the numbers reached 11 and then stay stable. But as you think, this is like declining the total in, in, in October in the city of Sao Paulo would have been something around 30%. And this show exactly what I'm saying. This is the decline that the antibody measured by the, the assay. And you can easily see that it's declining and here is increasing the number of the people slight near the cutoff value. And that's how the curve would look. Here is our, uh, the, 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 the attack rate that reached almost 75% uh, in October. And now we do have the data for the other cities and they look like really similar to the number of cases. So Fortaleza is another city that really reached high levels of antibody, while Recife and Salvador and Rio stay in the middle and Belo Horizonte and Curitiba with lower levels of prevalence. The key thing in, in this model is that when uh, for SARS-CoV-2, so the, the, the herd immunity threshold for a complete mixed population is around 60.7, assuming a, a three, a, a not of three. So we, sh we should wait for that the epidemic in this case would continue until it reaches 95% of the population, but they are not would decline after 66%, and we should not see an increasing number. So that's the expectation by this model. Anything that would be different than that would suggest something like reinfection or new variants or loss of, of, uh, of immunity. So we were quite surprised in October already when we saw this slight increasing number of cases. So we start feeling that, that we would need to do and try to understand better what was going on. And we were even more surprised in the numbers really reached this high level. So the first thing we tried to do was to, well, Let's see, so these are the, the things that could have happened to explain that. First, that we didn't really uh, measure, we overestimated the attack rate. And I'll show some, some of the data. And more people are working out on this and all the models end up going to this around that number of people infected by October. The other would be general degrees of immunity, a new lineage coming in and, uh, a new lineage with more transmissible capacity to be transmitted, like the B117. So, so the first I'll start showing that we believe the data is correct, that we did not overestimate. Uh, 
and the way of doing this, I'll show one way that it's the way I, I can explain because I'm not a modeling person. But one way of doing this is just try to decrease the cutoff value of the, the kit for something lower. So if we decrease to 0 0.1, this is how we get. So if we change the threshold, what was interesting is that by doing this, we really have uh, reached 53% in June. So we, this is without correction of the uh, antibody decline which is similar to all the other threshold when you correct for false positive and false negative. So the idea, well, let's take this month that everything is like measured and giving about the same result. And let's measure the IFR, how many people have died. And after that, let's measure how many people die and we correct using the IFR measure. And this is how we did, that's how it went for cut off of 0 0.1, it would stay stable, but we know even for this level, antibody would decline and we correct using the IFR and we reach about the same number without using all that uh, model to correct for antibody decline. So this is another way, just show that other groups are doing the same thing using other models. And in general, it reaches very much the similar Number. So we, we need to think that the majority of the people did uh, were exposed to the virus, which means that perhaps one fourth of the population, which is 500,000 people, were still uh, uh, not uh, previous exposed. This is still a lot of people. So if you have a really high uh, transmissible strain, uh, giving uh, being more or uh, pathogenic, then maybe you would have something similar as we saw. And it did we detect this new variant in, in, in early January uh, with more than 70 mutations standing the spike and three of them very similar to the African strain. And uh, so it's important to note that just before that there was also this other strain in Manaus that now we know that's all around Brazil that didn't have so many mutations, but did have this mutation E484 that is associated with, uh, with um, uh, escape mutant. So the idea now is we have more samples tested from Manaus that before November, there were very few P1 and P2. And then in December, we could see P2 in a higher proportion of cases, but P1 uh, went up from 49% to 80% in early January. So everything goes into the direction that P1 is more transmissible. And probably the other three uh, possibilities that I just mentioned would be, could explain all what happened in Manaus. So we still don't know, and we need to now, we are about to, to complete more sequences and you hear, you are probably gonna hear from, from our group soon, uh, trying to, to model how much more transmissible is this, this strain, but it's still hard to understand if it's more transmissible pathogenic, how frequent infection occurs. Uh, we know that there are a lot of infections in Manaus, but still it's not measured. Uh, so in a way that we could model and try to understand to understand whether people were partial protected or not for this strain. And it's now extremely important that we try to understand how effective are the vaccines available in Brazil for this specific strain. We are now detecting this strain all over Brazil. Around uh, more than 100,000 people traveled since December from Manaus to other, especially to the state of Sao Paulo. So we are expecting a quick extension of these um, variants across the country. So this is study where partially received funds from a bank in Brazil, Todos Pela Saúde, uh, FAPESP and MRC, and also the, all these centers, they are linked to a large study that's been occurring under NHLBI and NIH uh, program, uh, REDS program. 
So thank you very much. I hope I'm still the correct time. Wonderful, wonderful, Dr. Sabino. Uh, very interesting. And I think uh, you posed some very interesting questions at the end that we may be able to kind of uh, at least uh, predict of what it could happen um, or the kind of um, projections you, you, you feel, uh, the fact that you're having now these other variants in Brazil um, taking over, how is it going to shift really this uh, ability of maybe reaching some level of um, of uh, um, immunity uh, and protection and then their impact on vaccines. So let's move uh, now to our next speaker, Mr. Rafalovsky, who's gonna now tell us a little bit about um, the Israel vaccination program. Very, very exciting. Good afternoon from uh, Tel Aviv. Can you see my screen? Yes. So my name is Chaim, I'm the Disaster Management Coordinator of Magen David Adom in Israel. Can I interrupt you one, one quick second? It shows up as a, um, you have to change the screen view to make it um, up in the, because it looks like when you're seeing it as a, as a, as a screen view, not as the presentation mode. So, so a second, a second, please. Uh, Is it better now? No, you have to go up in display settings. Up here uh, it says I'm, display uh, this settings. Is, this, is, this is what exactly I did. Can you share the presentation? I think it would be faster. Can I think we, we can, we can, can see we anyway. It's okay. Okay. All right. You can take it on then. Uh, I'll let, me do, let me do this. Is it better now? Yes, you made it much bigger. Thank you. Okay, so we'll do it. We'll do it like this. Uh, so, as I said, my name is Chaim Ofalovsky. I'm the Disaster Management Coordinator of uh, Magen David Adom in Israel. Magen David Adom is the Red Cross Society of Israel and the uh, National EMS Emergency Medical Service Provider. Before I start talking about the vaccination in Israel, just please, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with. Uh, Israel, we are a country of 22,000 square kilometers and a population of 9.3 million inhabitants. So uh, that's an important factor when we speak about the vaccination program in Israel. And uh, here you can see um, the figures we have out of the 9.3 million inhabitants that we have uh, uh, in total, about 600,000 that are recovering from uh, COVID and will not be vaccinated at this stage, and another roughly 2.5 million children who are 16 years old and younger, thus will not be vaccinated. That leaves us with a total of 6 million people that uh, can be vaccinated. Out of them, as of yesterday, we have vaccinated 4.6 million, and... Uh, Half of them, about 3.2 million, are with the second uh, dose already, and most of them more than one week after that uh, second dose, which means that they are considered protected. For us, the most important thing is that uh, if you look into the population that are uh, 60 years old and older, if we combine those vaccinated and those uh, recovering, we have a protection factor of 92%. and uh, for those who are in the group age of 50 to 59, we are not that good. We are only at 76%, uh, which is uh, way lower than the 95% that we would like to reach. We have roughly around uh, 150,000 people still to vaccinate in the age group of 50 and older that are our top priority as a country. Uh, where is Israeli uh, vaccinating? And we have at the country, uh, all, all over the country, more than 400 sites at the moment, mainly through our HMO, which are the uh, USA term of health maintenance organizations. They are our primary healthcare providers. And in the hospitals, they are doing around 95% of the vaccination. 
And it's important to mention that uh, they are the ones who usually do vaccination in this country. When you get your uh, annual uh, flu vaccine, you go to primary health care. They are uh, represented all over the country. Uh, they run your medical file. So for them, yes, it's a logistics challenge, but they are doing vaccination on a daily basis. It's not something new for them. Magenda Vidadom, um, as a mobile organization, did all the long-term care facilities for elderly and people with the disability. And uh, 10 days ago, we already finished the vaccination of all the long-term care facilities in the country. So that population, which is the most vulnerable in this uh, situation of uh, COVID, uh, is already protected over 95% uh, rate of vaccination there. So we are very proud of that. We uh, outreach to communities uh, with our mobile uh, teams. We are doing vaccination at workplaces at the moment. If a workplace has more than uh, 100 people that are willing to be vaccinated, we will go there and we will have a very nice uh, project that you can see uh, at the bottom uh, with the municipality of Tel Aviv for a young population where uh, pubs uh, are willing to provide a free non-alcoholic drink to people who get vaccinated. So young people get a, a drink and a shot at the same time. And of course they place it over uh, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, that motivates other young people to be vaccinated. Um, just to show you uh, the results of a very large uh, study that was conducted by the Ministry of Health on the impact of the Pfizer vaccine. And it's important to know that um, Israel is vaccinating only with uh, Pfizer. And you can see the impact or the effectiveness of uh, the vaccine in the prevention of sickness, uh, the prevention of uh, fever sickness or respiratory syndrome, hospitalization, severe cases and death. And you can see here the impact after seven days and after 14 days. And I would draw your attention that after two, 14 days after the second shot, uh, the effectiveness uh, is considered as 99% preventing death and 99% preventing uh, severe cases of uh, coronavirus, which mean of, cor of corona severe illness, sorry. And uh, this of course shows uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine that we are using. And here you can see a number of cases uh, Per age group, um, the darker color is the two weeks vaccination, the lighter color is the one week, and the curve are the number uh, of cases, uh, the ratio of cases, sorry, per 100,000 um, cases uh, population. And you can see here the, uh, the impact mainly on the 60 and older, and this is a trend that uh, will continue, meaning that the vaccine is more, way more effective on the elderly uh, on the elderly group and here is the same uh, when you compare the cases per uh, compared to hospitalization and here you see the same the same trend but again more uh, impact on the 60 and older and this is the curve uh, that was done only for um, people that uh, got the uh, vaccine that are older than 60 years uh, old this is the uh, darker, the younger than 60 years, sorry, second dose, the darker, uh, the lighter color is the first dose. Uh, and th these are again the cases, and this is the death uh, ratio. And of course it shows the same, that the vaccine is uh, decreasing the number of death in the elderly. Um, the important, the first uh, factor that is important to remember about our uh, operation is that it is run centralized by our uh, Ministry of Health and they have a dedicated unit who is doing the whole procurement process of vaccines, of the uh, supplies. They allocate the amount of vaccines that will go to each and every site. We are running the operation, the Ministry of Health is running the operation at the level of the site. It's not a global per uh, number of population. It's okay, each and every organization which is vaccinating has to present a plan. It is approved and then you receive three days ahead 
the supplies and the vaccines, and they are monitoring on a daily and hourly basis the amount of vaccines that uh, is being actually administered, and of course, uh, they adjust the program accordingly. We started vaccinating people over 60, then uh, and the frontline healthcare providers, the, and the residents of the long-term care facilities. This was our first group. Then we went to pregnant women, and the reason that pregnant women suddenly jumped into the top of the list was the impact of the UK variant in Israel causing severe cases and death cases among pregnant women. At the moment, all over the country, we have 14 women that are in critical condition. Uh, out of them, eight are ventilated and uh, four are uh, connected to an ECPO machine. Teachers, in order to allow, resume classes and 16 to 18 years old uh, to allow them to prepare to the SATs at uh, that will come very soon, <coughs> sorry, in, uh, in June. And then, of course, we went to the rest of the population. Israel at the moment is uh, vaccinating all the population that are older than 16, and the vaccination is open uh, to everyone. One of the major issues that we had uh, was and is the fact that uh, we were vaccinating in the peak of the third wave of critical patients, the wave that uh, was the worst ever in Israel. Just to give you an idea, during January, uh, Israel lost 1,500 and something people to COVID. 1,500 people died just in one month, which is a figure that we never saw. That was January. We started vaccinating mid-December, um, so you can imagine uh, that we did not have the extra manpower of nurses available for vaccination. This is why nursing students uh, were allowed and based on a special vaccination program, emergency medical technicians, the EMTs of Magen David Adom, as you can see uh, on the uh, photos, that we are allowed to vaccinate uh, using nurses in the supervisory role and decision-making role and not just doing any simple intramuscular uh, vaccination. When it comes to the logistics, as I already said, we are doing only Pfizer uh, vaccines and with the idea that we have a one-way street with one deep freeze facility, minus 70 centigrade. It's uh, easy because we are a small country. Within five hours, we will get to any point in the country. To the on-site refrigerators, which are two to eight degrees centigrade to the actual vaccination. And that gives us uh, 20, 120 hours uh, on the refrigerator and three hours to vaccinate. And um, thanks to a very close uh, work of the Ministry of Health with Pfizer, we are not using any longer, almost none of the trays of 100 vials, which implies more than 1,000 people that have to be vaccinated on that side. We have the capacity to have uh, trays of 15 vaccines, 10 vaccines, five vaccines, and even a single vaccine, which is especially important for people who are hospitalized at home and uh, we need to outreach to their houses to, to vaccinate them. One of our greatest uh, challenges was the transfer of information because unlike during a normal vaccination, Different organizations were vaccinating people that belong to different uh, HMOs. And at the end of the day, the information had to go from the vaccinating body to the personal medical file at the HMO. Uh, from the vaccinating body to the MOH system to uh, have a record of all the people in the country that got the vaccine. And inside the MOH to another uh, system, which at the end of the day will create for you what we call the green tag, which is the proof that you are vaccinated or recovered from COVID and will give you some uh, lenience when it comes to uh, restrictions. And uh, we need to remember that uh, all that data is protected by law because it's medical personal data. You can understand the many IT challenges that we had. And of course, uh, we had to set up the second appointment that not always was done by the same organization because, for example, people who were vaccinated at the hospital because they were hospitalized while they received the first dose will be vaccinated by the HMO uh, for their second dose. And that's, again, an IT challenge. Uh, you can see here a 
photo that I uh, discussed with myself, should I put it or not? This is uh, in a marketplace in Jerusalem, uh, which is a not a good photo because people are standing too close one to the other. And the, the term, are we having vaccination sites or contamination sites uh, is always a challenge. And uh, taking the precautions, making sure that everyone is wearing a mask and scheduling people to avoid that is, is a challenge. We decided to go for a speedy process. We are very proud that people uh, usually say that the 15 minutes they had to wait after they received the vaccine which was about three times more the time that they spent actually in the registration and in the actual vaccination. And in Magenda Vida Dome, we developed a dedicated IT system to run this whole operation, which is making our life much uh, easier. What are our challenges? One was the decision that uh, we should vaccinate everyone who is resident in Israel, even if they are irregular migrants. But uh, then it was a discussion with our migration authorities that the information gathered will be never used because you uh, re have to remember that we are collecting their passport numbers and their cellular numbers so we can uh, call them for the second appointment. And uh, it was a, an interesting discussion what do we do with the leftovers? At the end of the day, okay, I have 20 doses uh, left over. I've do I'm done with my planning for today. Am I going to give them to uh, people who are not officially eligible or am I going to throw them away? I can tell you that uh, I'm a Jewish, Polish boy. So I was brought up with the idea that you never leave food on the plate. So uh, we took the same approach that we never uh, throw away a dose and if we have people who are willing to be vaccinated and are not in the exact group, we are not going to waste good uh, vaccines. Home hospitalization cases, we have quite a lot of them. And uh, of course, bringing them to the vaccination sites uh, is, a, is a challenge. Um, the discussion which is going on, should we vaccinate recovering COVID patients? Uh, most probably they will receive one dose if it's three months after they are recovered. Uh, still to happen. Um, we need to remember that uh, people are asking me, when are we going to finish the operation? And my answer is never. We need to remember that uh, as long as we have an age limitation, we will always have those that will come to the point where they can be vaccinated. It doesn't matter if they are 16 or six years old. And uh, so we will need to create a system which will, is going to be a challenging logistical system to vaccinate uh, all those who celebrate a certain birthday or migrate uh, into the country. Of course, we have to prepare for the option that uh, we will need a third dose uh, because of the variants. And uh, it is a great uh, challenge talking to people, uh, telling them that the vaccine is very effective. Yes, but you might need a third dose. We have a very, um, we have an issue with certain communities based on lack of trust in uh, the authorities. We, um, religious issues that require a specific approach. We were very successful talking to the religious leaders, uh, both in the Muslim communities and in the uh, extra uh, ultra Orthodox Jewish communities um, to talk to their people and explain to them why they must get the vaccine and it is an act of faith uh, for them to vaccinate. And um, we have a very strong uh, anti-vaccination campaign. I think that we underestimated the uh, anti-vaccination feeling, especially among uh, young people. Uh, all the rumors about the second dose uh, side effects, we have a 2% of no-show of people that uh, got the vaccine and are not coming back to receive the second uh, dose. And uh, we, we are struggling with that. We, uh, as you saw on the data, we have 1.5 million uh, people that are not vaccinated yet. And we think we are already seeing the decrease in the speed of the vaccination because uh, now we are with those who really don't want to get uh, the vaccine. Very interestingly, it's about personal trust. I think, uh, especially among young people, it's an issue of generation. People don't want to hear educated uh, lectures over TV. They want to have a dialogue, a two-way conversation with an expert uh, through a virtual platform. It's, it's okay. So don't preach me about the vaccine, but allow me to ask my questions, share my concerns, get the respect for my concerns and get the answers uh, 
I want. What are our lessons observed? Um, one of the key issues is working as one healthcare system. I'm always asked about uh, the role of private companies, private entities, NGOs. Uh, in Israel, we have the disadvantage that the whole healthcare system is working as one healthcare system, regardless if we are governmental, non-governmental, NGOs, private or public organizations. This is really giving us the strength. Um, the fact that EMTs are allowed to vaccinate uh, allowed us to do a very fast uh, activity or program uh, in Israel. Uh, being flexible, going, as I said, mobile is, is important. The trust that uh, our volunteers in the community have is key to convincing people our approach is using our volunteers in the community and sending them to talk to their families and uh, with their relatives and friends. That's one of the key points that really allows us to uh, be successful. This is an ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish community in the uh, north of Israel. Uh, on the first uh, attempt to vaccinate, we had 47 people from that community. On the second one, after our volunteers spoke with their peers, we had more than 150. As I said, IT and data transfer were a major uh, challenge and our greatest challenge is the fact that we have here a conflicting message which is very difficult to explain to people how come the vaccine is very uh, effective but at the same time we need to maintain all the precautions wear masks keep the distance avoid gatherings and uh, make sure that uh, our uh, environment is uh, highly sanitized People don't understand it. I would say even people in the healthcare sector don't understand it and are asking you, why should I be wearing a mask every time I enter your office if you are vaccinated and I'm vaccinated? It's a very tough message and we are seeing a new peak in cases in Israel and we are really concerned that with the variants, we might be uh, behind with the new variants uh, with our vaccination program. Uh, this is the word hope in Israel and hope for us is the vaccine. So I will thank you for your attention and uh, ask you please to stay safe, take good care of yourself, yours and your team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was quite an enlightening presentation and um, start uh, keeping in the back of your mind because we've gotten a couple of uh, queries uh, for, for you. Uh, especially in the area of acceptability in pregnant women, um, the strategies of uh, vaccinating within hospitalized uh, individuals. So um, we look forward to extending a little bit the conversation with you. Uh, let's move forward with Dr. Safari now, who very importantly is going to tell us everything about what, are ha what is happening with COVID-19 vaccine implementation in Latin America. Welcome. Okay, thank you. I think we need to have so, it on uh, presentation mode. We can mm -hmm. see it. I'm trying. Okay, I think I have it in the presentation mode. Just confirm for me, please. Confirmed. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation, uh, Dr. Uh, Butazzi and Dr. Espinal and all other staff from Florida International University. It's a real pleasure uh, to participate in this very exciting meeting. And last but not least, let, let's speak about Latin America and more specifically in the vaccine implementation in, in our region. So I'll, I'll present some, some data. Uh, uh, before presenting the, the vaccine implementation itself, I would just like to uh, really set the stage of the uh, current disease rates in Latin America. So very briefly, uh, just to highlight what is going on in the region, uh, probably one of the most hardest hit regions in the world. Uh, this is data from Imperial College just published showing the uh, reproductive number of some South American countries. and. As we can see here, and, and these are the figures uh, among these countries in Latin America, we still have some countries uh, with a reproductive number uh, above one, which means uh, community transmission, uh, it's really uh, 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 increasing in some, in some regions, especially in Brazil, as 
you all became aware uh, in, in the previous presentation. Uh, this is the current uh, toll number in, in South America. We currently have almost 18 million cases reported uh, and approximately uh, uh, 560,000 deaths related to uh, COVID-19. Just as a provocative uh, thought, these are numbers I compared uh, in 2020 uh, of influenza and COVID-19 regarding death. And as you can see here, among influenza death, 12% of the deaths occurred in children and adolescents, and 50% of the death uh, in uh, adults above 60 years of age. When we look at COVID-19, we have less than 1% of the death in children and adolescents, and 72% in adults uh, above 60 years of age. These are also a provocative slide just to highlight and to compare a little bit the impact of uh, COVID-19 and influenza regarding case fatality rate and mortality rate. So these are the figures. When you look at the mortality rate last year in Brazil for influenza, and important to mention, uh, one of the lowest influenza seasons we have ever had, at least since we are looking at these uh, numbers more closely. We have 0 0.1 death per 100,000 inhabitants comparing to almost 90 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants uh, for COVID-19. And even, even if we look at case fatality rates of severe acute respiratory syndrome, these are hospitalizations due to respiratory uh, syndrome. For influenza, the case fatality rates among the hospitalized uh, uh, persons was 13% comparing to 33% uh, for COVID-19. So let's move now to Latin America. What I did here was to collect data uh, from the region, from South and Central America and, and Mexico, and just to compare uh, incidence rates. So what you see in yellow are cases per 100,000 population. Uh, it means uh, you have like Panama with the highest incidence in the region, uh, approximately 77 cases per 1,000 population. And I also include here the testing uh, that was done in those countries just to see uh, how reliable may this data become when you look at what is really being tested. And as you can see here, the two countries that are doing theoretically the best job are Chile and Panama, which are testing uh, approximately uh, 500 tests per 1,000 population. Uh, and as you can see here uh, the, in yellow, the incidence rates of disease. So let's move to case fatality rate. And when we look at only death reported among the cases reported in all the region, we see that Mexico is, is, is the country with the highest case fatality rate, almost 10%. It's a real, uh, uh, very high case fatality rate. Then we have Ecuador, then Argentina and Peru. These, these four countries are the countries with the highest case fatality rate in the region. So let's move to the vaccines itself. So these are the three countries that were the first countries in Latin America to start vaccination programs against uh, COVID-19. Uh, they started in late December, uh, almost at the same time, Mexico, Chile, and Costa Rica. Uh, these are the different vaccines that are being used <clears throat> in Latin America. Uh, and as you can see here, the countries are using uh, generally more than one vaccine, uh, and, and I will highlight in details uh, uh, in the next slides. Uh, these are data from uh, uh, John Hopkins showing a cumulative COVID-19 vaccination doses per 100 people. So wh what you see here, the darker the country is, the higher is the percentage of the population that has been vaccinated. And here are our region, 
And as you can see here, the countries that are leading, and I will show it in details, uh, are Chile, uh, US, uh, Brazil, uh, Mexico, uh, and Argentina. These are uh, vaccination doses per 100,000. These are world data. And as we learned it previously from Dr. Shaheen, Israel, uh, together with United Arab Emirates, are the countries in the world that, that have the highest proportion of their population already vaccinated. Then we come to United Kingdom, United States, Chile, uh, European Union, Brazil, and then we go for the uh, uh, other countries. These are only uh, uh, vaccine doses per 100 people in countries with highest to, uh, total vaccination. It means uh, uh, countries that have more than uh, uh, determined million of doses of vaccine already delivered. And here we see our region, including North America. So these are doses per 100,000 population but only from American countries, United States, Chile, then we have Canada, then we have Brazil, then Costa Rica, then Argentina, Panama, Mexico, Peru, uh, Dominican Republic, and Colombia. So these are the uh, 10 uh, uh, first countries in the region, in the American uh, region, with the highest proportion of the population already receiving at least one dose uh, of a COVID-19 vaccine. In more details, these are the uh, uh, vaccination doses per 100 people. Uh, Chile has already 16, uh, United States 20, Canada 4, Brazil 3.5, and then it comes Argentina, uh, uh, Mexico, uh, Panama, Costa Rica, etc. Uh, two words about COVAX. I, I think we have already a presentation highlighting the importance COVAX has in terms of equity and distribution of vaccines. Uh, COVAX hopes to deliver more than 2 billion, uh, a, a very challenging uh, aim to deliver more than 2 billion doses to, to people in, in, in almost 200 countries in less than one year. Uh, it's led by the WHO and also involves Gavi uh, and the coalition and, and, and CEPI. And the good news is that Ghana has become the first country in the world to receive vaccines under the COVAX uh, facility. Uh, was more than 500,000 doses that was delivered to Ghana. Uh, and in our region, we have 37 countries and territories in the American region that is that are participating in the COVAX uh, mechanism. Of these 27 of these countries uh, will do uh, with their own financing and 10 of those countries uh, will do so at no cost due to their economic condition or population size. Uh, the good news is that at least four countries in the region uh, were the first four selected countries uh, to receive the first COVAX uh, delivers in, in, in Latin America, which is Bolivia, Colombia, El Salvador, and Peru. And these are the uh, stages uh, from the priority allocation. Uh, let's now highlight some details about determined countries. And now we start to my country, but Brazil, as you were aware, Brazil had, had more than, has more than 200 million inhabitants. Uh, we started our vaccination program almost 40 days ago on January 17. Uh, we started the vaccination with two vaccines that are currently the only vaccines that are being used in Brazil. Uh, the Sinovac, which is the viral inactivated vaccine uh, from uh, Sinovac, and the uh, vector viral, uh, the adenoviral vector uh, vaccine from uh, Oxford AstraZeneca. So these are the two vaccines that are being used in, in Brazil. Uh, the target in Brazil is approximately 80 million persons. Important to highlight for those who are not familiar with uh, Brazilian immunization program, we every year vaccinate approximately 70 million persons for influenza with a very high coverage. So the target vaccination of 80 million persons in Brazil is more or less the same number of persons that are yearly being vaccinated against uh, influenza. And also to start uh, a bit, 
uh, of our challenges. Uh, our Mr. President on November last year said he would not take the, the vaccine in a pronunciation, uh, uh, really helping the immunization plan from Brazil. Uh, these are the priority groups defined for the immunization. We are still vaccinating uh, elderly uh, and healthcare workers and persons from uh, and native persons and persons that live in, in long term facilities. These are the current numbers by state. And we recently were aware of the situation in the Amazon state. So, uh, in trying to deliver in equity the distribution of vaccines. Currently, the state of Amazonas is the state with the highest proportion of the population already, vaccination, already vaccinated, clearly far from the proportion uh, that we would really uh, like to have in a place that is really facing a tremendous impact uh, of COVID-19. So uh, the uh, speed of the vaccination program here in Brazil is, is, is really not reaching the speed, the ideal speed that we should need, taking in account the limited supply of vaccines that we are currently facing. So let's move to Chile. Uh, and Chile, as I pointed out, is the leading country in uh, Latin America uh, regarding proportion of the population already vaccinated. Uh, Chile is using uh, AstraZeneca, Oxford vaccine, Pfizer vaccine, and uh, Sinovac vaccine. These are the three vaccines that are currently being used in Chile, and they are also doing some deals, uh, maybe to start using the Sputnik vaccine uh, <coughs> from Gamalea. Uh, the ambitious plan in Chile is to immunize approximately 16 million persons, taking in account that Chile has 19 million inhabitants. So they have a really ambitious uh, plan uh, to vaccinate uh, a real high proportion of the population and uh, targeting 6 million of these 16 by the end of the first quarter of 2021. Uh, these are current numbers that I took from the page from Chile. Uh, from yesterday, they already vaccinated 3 million uh, persons in Chile. Uh, almost half of them uh, were persons above uh, 65 years of age. 60% of the uh, vaccinated persons were women, uh, for approximately 40% uh, were men. And these are the stages of the, va the vaccination program. They are progressing uh, to, to vaccinate uh, uh, educational staff, which is really interesting. They decided to vaccinate and prioritize education staff, uh, 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 highlighting the importance of keeping uh, the schools open, which for children is really crucial. Argentina, Argentina has a, a deal uh, to, with AstraZeneca to, and, and Oxford to produce locally the vaccine. They did an agreement to produce in partnership uh, with, with Mexico, and this will be dis distributed to all Latin America, except to Brazil, that has uh, uh, its own program for the production uh, of the Oxford uh, vaccine in Biomanguinhos in, in Rio de Janeiro. So the national plan in Argentina your is to... Time, your time is getting to a close. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, almost 60 million doses across the country uh, in 2021. This is Colombia, this is a country that uh, really uh, uh, initiate recently the program with these vaccines. Mexico, that has at least five vaccines being used in Mexico and really progressing uh, with the vaccination. And just to finish my presentation uh, among the challenges, these are uh, press news about three countries in Latin America that were related to uh, uh, Peru, uh, with vaccinated at least uh, uh, 500 persons with received the vaccine when it was still in clinical trials. Argentina that also did some VIP vaccinations. And it happens also, unfortunately, in Chile, with almost 40,000 persons uh, that were uh, vaccinated that were persons not included in the priority groups. 
and it was, was uh, like the uh, uh, yesterday in Lancet, the Peruvian situation was published in Lancet uh, 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 yesterday, uh, highlighting uh, what happened in Peru. So just to finish really, uh, lessons not properly learned from the past. I mean the importance of using masks. Uh, we learned that more than 100 years ago, and even after 100 years, we still have persons uh, challenging the importance of using masks. Uh, so the message here is even after being vaccinated, keep wearing your mask. And also we face some challenges regarding misconception on vaccines in the past, and we still see these misconceptions in the current days. So this is my last slide. These are remaining challenges that we should be aware. Long-term protection after vaccination, data and safety and immunogenicity in children and adolescents. As a pediatrician, I'm really looking forward to start uh, uh, studying vaccines in children and adolescents. They represent almost 30% of the population in our region. And definitely to achieve control of this pandemic, children and adolescents should be targeted with the vaccine. Uh, uh, obviously, if we have data showing the safety uh, and the uh, uh, immunogenicity of this vaccine in, in these age groups. We are facing also in our region an extra challenge, which is influenza vaccination program together with COVID-19 program, uh, not having data that uh, allowed us to co-administrate these vaccines. So it's a real challenge to deliver three visits from determined age groups when influenza and COVID-19 uh, vaccines are together uh, in, in national immunization programs, safety in pregnant women, impact of these variants and, and looking for uh, uh, pharmacovigilance and last but not least looking for more stable second generation formulations of some vaccines that are really crucial uh, uh, to have in our region. So thank you for your attention. I think I completed the 20 minutes even. <laughs> perfect, perfect, Dr. Safari. And we're going to uh, start bringing in the panelists that I can introduce in a second. But I have to tell you that it's been mind blowing hearing about what's happening in the Latin American region. So many questions, challenges, especially when you have groups that are bringing in uh, different vaccines and how logistically, especially in the pharmacovigilance arena, how can we really measure um, tracing and tracking who got which vaccine and how we're, of course, keeping track of all this information. Um, the, as you said, some countries having the benefit of even being able to produce locally versus uh, some of us um, still waiting to be on the list of even receiving these types of vaccines. Uh, it's unfortunate that even within the region, those who are more um, middle high income countries have already started when the poorest of the countries really are uh, not received much, uh, if any. Um, so many questions that we will probably uh, be able to discuss through the 